Hello class, and welcome to our lecture on Afghanistan. This will be a three-part lecture. I imagine that most of us will find this rather invigorating to listen to, since so many of us are familiar with the September 11th attacks, at least from what I'm seeing in the, um, the responses on the discussion board uh, about uh, who you are and what your background is. So the September 11th attacks will certainly play an important role in our lecture, but not until the final video. Uh, in this early one and the second one, we're going to talk about some of the important events that are going to lead to what eventually will happen during those terrorist attacks. But in the, in the meantime, I want you to put the terrorist attacks on September 11th out of your mind and let's look at Afghanistan as a whole, as a nation, as a former kingdom with a very large and long history although a certainly rocky one at that. Now, I want to begin by addressing a common misconception about Afghanistan. I don't know if any of you have it, but I certainly still find students from time to time that uh, inappropriately label Afghanistan as being part of the Middle East. It is not part of the Middle East. Afghanistan is actually in Asia. Afghanistan Pakistan, India, uh, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan, all of those states with the name Stan in them, Stan meaning state, are actually part of Asia. So Afghanistan is not uh, in the Middle East, it's in Asia, and the people who live in Afghanistan are not Arabs or Middle East Arabs, they are Afghanis. Although what exactly an Afghani is, is subject to debate, and I'll explain why in a moment. So keep that in mind. This is not the Middle East. This is Asia, and Afghanis are not Arabs. They are Afghanis. Now, there are Arabs living in Afghanistan. And again, not to beat a dead horse, but I'll talk about that later. Uh, the majority of them are going to be different ethnic groups that really have very little in common with the Middle East. They're going to have more in common with uh, Mongolia, with uh, East Asia and Central Asia, uh, whether they're Turkmen, whether they are of uh, Turkic or Tartar descent, uh, we're going to get into a very ethnic discussion. And while I will try to limit that, uh, Afghanistan is perhaps the most uh, difficult country to discuss in our small six weeks together because it is probably the most diverse. Certainly Russia, the Soviet Union, is very diverse because the countries you see here, for example, Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan, are part of the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union will seize Turkmenistan and Tajikistan, and they'll also try to seize Afghanistan as well. And the Soviet Union controls Poland, Ukraine. Uh, they, they, they all are... Uh, um, uh, wholesale own, own Ukraine, whereas more or less they use Poland as a uh, satellite state. So, so perhaps the Soviet Union is the most uh, diverse country, and the United States certainly is diverse as well because they have Mexican Americans and African Americans and and uh, various white European Americans of every type of ethnic uh, background possible. But Afghanistan is truly uh, diverse. And it's not simply diverse in the sense that people from different cultural backgrounds live there. It's diverse in that Afghanistan, this country you see in front of you, is so widely different from region to region that it almost isn't a country. It's more like a block of many countries uh, with their own laws, customs, lineages, and traditions. It's not a very easy country to talk about. It's almost, um, it's almost a, a, a false construction. So let's get in, let's dive into the, the difficult history of Afghanistan. And I have limited a lot of this. I have cut quite a bit out. I did, uh, in my 15 weeks, spend a lot more time talking about pre-1945 Afghanistan so that people could have a better understanding of how we got to where we are today. I have left some of that in place, but I couldn't go the full distance. So I'm going to kind of freestyle some of this and add as we go. But keep in mind that uh, if you want to know more about Afghanistan, certainly an encyclopedia will help. But I will try to highlight some of the important points. Before we move on, I want to just point out one final thing about Afghanistan. 
And you notice it is a landlocked country. It is one of the few countries we're discussing that has no shore to it whatsoever. And this is part of the mystique of Afghanistan. And I'll show this on, the next, on, on one of the later slides. Afghanistan is a landlocked country, and geographically, it is a highly isolated one. And this is going to add to its unique culture and add to its unique uh, tradition and uh, psychological mentality, if I can use the, uh, use the term. Let us continue. All of the slides that I created for my 15-week course included some kind of statistical slide, but I removed quite a bit of those for the six-week course because it didn't necessarily apply because despite whether or not you think my videos are long or short, uh, these are actually very abbreviated because, again, Afghanistan had three or four days committed to it. Uh, Algeria and, uh, and uh, decolonization had three days, uh, three days for the Cold War, four days for India, four days for Iran and the Middle East, and, and uh, three additional days for Israel on top of that. But I've made an attempt to try to bring a little geography into these, into these courses because I'm surprised still that so many people don't know where these countries are. The reason why I left the statistical picture here for Afghanistan up, whereas I got rid of the other ones, is because it truly is important for this one. The population numbers are certainly, certainly key, but I'm specifically focusing on languages, ethnic makeup, and religion. So let's look at those three aspects here. There are three major languages in Afghanistan, Pashto, Dari, and Arabic. And there are numerous dialects between regions. So people who may speak, say, Pashto in the south uh, and people who speak Pashto in the north don't necessarily speak the same dialect of Pashto. The way people in southern Germany speak a dialect of German uh, that's similar to what you find in Austria and Switzerland, but is almost indistinguishable from what you hear in northern Germany. So if you've taken German before, and I saw that two or three of you have. If you've taken German before, most of you have probably taken German that has the northern dialect, and that is common. The southern dialect is very difficult to understand, almost like you're speaking a different language. Think about, I don't have a, there's no good, there is absolutely no good American parallel here, but to, to come up with one, to come up with one, and I do apologize, I don't, don't mean to be offensive, but if you've ever been into the deepest parts of Appalachia, say in, in the most remote parts of West Virginia or the most remote parts of Southeastern Ohio or the most Western reaches of, of North Carolina, though this isn't always the case anymore because people do move around a lot, so dialects change, but you'll find people who are there and they speak English, but the accent they use the, lang the, 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 the linguistic tones that they use, the slang, the, uh, the, the beats and the measures are so radically different that you can't really even understand them sometimes. And it's not because you can't understand them, it's just that you don't follow what they're saying. And that's what we have here. You have a very linguistically diverse country. Arabic is spoken by some people in Afghanistan, mainly people who are of Arab descent, which are not many. But Arabic is, is listed as one of the key languages primarily because it, the main religion of Afghanistan is Islam. And Arabic is the textual language of the Quran. So although Arabic is not spoken per se in most Islamic countries, it is known because it is a red language. If you are familiar uh, with uh, the traditional uh, Christian faiths, the older European ones, specifically Roman Catholicism, and I know that I saw some of you took medieval history here at UNCG, the original Western Bible, as created by the Romans, at least, who founded uh, Roman Catholicism, uh, was written in Latin. So Latin is still well read, but nobody speaks Latin anymore. It's more or less a dead language. Arabic is not a dead language, but you'll find countries where people don't know how to speak Arabic whatsoever. They couldn't they couldn't hold a conversation with it if they tried, but they can read it because they have to read it in order to decipher the, the religious text. So Arabic is still listed as an important language here, though not necessarily a spoken one. 
ethnicity is what's going to make Afghanistan truly unique. 14 distinct ethnic and tribal groups make up the, Af the Afghani population. We will not talk about all of them. We're not even going to talk about most of the key ones here, but I will list them for you. You see them there. Pashtun, Tazik, Hazara, Uzbek, Amik, and Turkmen are the largest and most important uh, uh, ethnic groups in Afghanistan, with the three most important being Pashtun, Tazik, and Hazara, uh, although Uzbek and Turkmen are very important. Amik uh, does not come up as much, but Pashtun, Tazik, and Hazara are the most important um, uh, tribal and ethnic groups in Afghanistan, with Pashtun being the largest. The religion of Afghanistan is Islam, and I didn't have a lot of time to get into the differences of Islam because Islam is not one gigantic central religion. It's, uh, it's very diverse, and it's very decentralized. There is no pope of Islam. There are no bishops of Islam. There is no uh, church of Islam, uh, to bring in Christian comparisons. Uh, Islam has uh, several branches to it, but the two major branches are Sunni and Shia. And if I recall, I may have mentioned Sunni once before, maybe in our discussion of Algeria. I'm going to get into some of the differences between Sunni Islam and Shia Islam in our final uh, lecture on Iran and Iraq and the Persian Gulf Wars, because that's going to be much more appropriate, the differences between Sunni and Shia. So I'll dedicate one or two slides to that and then highlight those differences as we go through. But keep in mind, those distinguishes, uh, distinguishing characteristics aside, the majority of Afghani population is going to be Muslim, and predominantly it's going to be Sunni Islam, but I'll get, I'll get to that when we, when we talk about um, Iran next week. Oops, sorry. Uh, this is a picture of Afghanis cultivating an opium field. Uh, opium poppies, which are used to make morphine and also make heroin for the black market, are largely grown in Afghanistan. Or, well, let me, let me put it this way. It's one of their largest exports. They're also grown in other places as well. I've left a number of the old slides that I typically use for my 15-week courses. I made my 15-week world history course more like a uh, uh, quasi-geography course because it's so important to locate these countries geographically uh, in the world because so much of what we know about each other and so much of how we develop as, a, as different peoples is often derived from geography. It's not simply culture or political ideas. It's also geography. It's mountains, it's rivers, it's valleys, it's natural resources. Afghanistan, again, being very unique, it's highly affected by its geography. All the countries we've talked about are from the United States, the Soviet Union, to uh, last week when we talked about Algeria and how so much of the population settled really in the northern part of Algeria, where the weather was more tepid and more Mediterranean. And this specifically applied to the French, who seized most of the good land and used it to cultivate wine and uh, transform northern Algeria essentially into the south of France. But in this case, geography is going to be much more prevalent as a character. It's going to be much more important in how uh, the laws, the politics, the traditions, and the customs of Afghanis are derived and developed. And this, of course, affects how outsiders are going to have to interact with the Afghani world. So here is a Landsat map of Afghanistan. And as you can see, the white sections, the red and white sections, are elevation markers. So green is lower in elevation, red is, or yellow is higher, orange is higher than that, red is higher than that, and white is the highest of them all. Afghanistan is located in a very mountainous region that's leading towards the steps of what eventually becomes the Himalayans. So it's a very mountainous country. Iran is like this as well, and wouldn't you know it, there is Iran over here. But as you can see, unlike India and Pakistan, which themselves do have mountainous ranges, they don't have as many, Afghanis don't have many valleys. You're getting into the steppes. These are where the highest mountains uh, in Afghanistan are, 
leading into Tajikistan and towards China because you're getting into the Himalayan steppes, the Him Himalayan mountains. You're getting closer and closer to uh, shifting to my seat. You're getting closer and closer to the rooftop of the world. Afghanistan has only a few areas where people can truly live in community settings. They have kind of an arid desert down over here in the southwest section. They also have an arid, though slightly cooler and higher in elevation area here to the south. For the most part, they have an area here near Kabul, right in here, which is in the mountains, although Kabul sits in a valley which is only accessible by a few roads in and out of the central region of Afghanistan. And perhaps the most important part of Afghanistan is this fertile valley, which sits up rather high in elevation, but it's cool and there is rainfall and you can grow food uh, there as well as things like poppies. So Afghanistan, though, it's not a small country. It's somewhat worthless agriculturally. You don't get a lot of... Uh, farming here in Afghanistan. You get small gardens maybe, but most of their food comes from neighboring countries like Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Pakistan, India to the south. Iran does ship food into Afghanistan, and Afghanistan does grow some of its own food. But as you can see, again, since most of the land is in mountainous regions, they really can't do much. So geographically landlocked, rugged mountain terrain. This is called the Hindu Kush, or the Baba, or the Safe Ko. Uh, fertile no uh, northern plains, arid southwestern plateau. Pretty much everything I said before. Here's a great picture of pack animals leading uh, uh, commerce and trade through the mountains of the Hindu Kush. This is moving closer and closer towards the Himalayas. Here's a great picture that offers a wonderful contrast. Uh, this would be closer to the fertile northern plains, but as you can see, they are still surrounded by valleys, mountainous valleys. It's actually very beautiful when you look at it. You can see they do have farms here. There is very good agricultural land. Here's a charming little hamlet, little town, but they are completely surrounded by these mountains. And while there is a river here, there, there are precious few ways in and out of these areas. So the people who live in these regions Although they do have communication with people from other parts of Afghanistan, there isn't a lot to be said about, about um, um, mass communication and interaction. These people are typically semi-isolated from each other, and they develop these different cultures and customs and these different lineages uh, that are very different from one another. So again, in keeping with the different ethnicities, 14 ethnicities, six major ones, uh, what we call Afghanis are really a um, social construct, a modern construct. There really is no such thing as an Afghani. Uh, an Afghani is kind of like being an American. Because what does it mean to be an American? Uh, to be an American is really a, a national construct. We have uh, a certain shared history. We have a certain shared legal tradition. We have a, a certain, uh, certain shared uh, cultural custom. <clears throat> some taste in music, uh, although that's very diverse. Uh, we have pop cultural uh, symbolism and things that we all know and understand, but we all interact with each other. We can all look at each other as being American. The Afghanis, that term Afghani is very similar to American because it's supposed to suggest some sort of unified culture, uh, custom and tradition among these 14 different ethnic groups. But because they are so geographically isolated from one another, they don't form the same uh, synergy as Americans do with each other. And heck, even Americans don't always get along with each other and, and recognize each other as Americans. So the diversity of idea and opinion here in Afghanistan is going to be very different to the point where people in the northern plain are not going to really recognize people in Kabul as being similar to each other, let alone having anything in common with one another. So just keep that in mind. This is a very uh, divided nation. So let's see how that plays out with human geography. <laughs> so human geography is how uh, different ethnicities come together, uh, the breakdown of diff different ethnicities and races, uh, religion, age, race, sex, uh, so on and so forth, all the things that make up 
what humans are, population density. And this is a great picture that illustrates population density and breakdown. So you can see that there aren't a lot of people that live in Afghanistan uh, as a whole. There's pockets of densely populated areas, but there's also large swaths where there's not a lot of people to begin with. So for example, over in the desert area close to Iran, you have one to 15 uh, uh, people per square mile. Wait, did I read that right? I'm sorry. Yeah, one to 15 people per square mile. Nobody really lives in this area. But it gets a little bit denser over here in the mountainous or semi-mountainous regions. But it's these large uh, red circles which denote the major cities. And you can see the majority of the population of Afghanistan lives right over here where Kabul and Jalalabad are. These are the two largest cities and regions of Afghanistan, with the largest city in the west being Herat and the largest city in the north being Kunduz. Kabul and Jala uh, Jalalabad are the two largest cities. Kandahar is the largest city to the south. I believe Kandahar is actually the third largest city. And it's the largest city in what's called the Peshtu region of Afghanistan. These darker areas here, you can see by the uh, legend down here, denote population density. And these denote over here city size. So Kabul is the largest city. Jahalabad is the second. Kandahar the third. Kunduz. Herat, so on and so forth. This is a road that was built by Afghanis, uh, Afghanis in the 1960s and 1970s, and I think it was added on to in the 1980s. This pretty much is the main road that connects all of Afghanistan together. Without this road, you really can't get from Herat, say, to Kabul. There is no pass that goes through the mountains. There are trails where you can take pack animals, as you can see here, but if you want to travel by car or by a, maybe a larger caravan of horses, something with more of a modern edge to it, the best that you have is this large highway that circumnavigates, like a large circle, the central part of the country. Nothing pretty much over here, nothing in the middle, and nothing down here away from the highway. You want to get to these places, uh, you have to take either smaller roads, which do exist, uh, you can see here primary roads and secondary roads. So these gray roads are secondary roads, but these secondary roads are not always paved. Some of them are simply trails. So Afghanistan does have roads, but it's real main road. It's the closest thing to an interstate highway in Afghanistan is this one large semicircle that connects the major cities together. Ethnic groups are broken down by geography too. Mountains divide different groups. Ethnicities settle in different regions. They come to dominate different regions. There are minority ethnicities that live in different regions surrounded by these majorities. And then the mountains further divide and subdivide and isolate different groups from each other. To invade one part of Afghanistan, for example, and try to conquer that doesn't mean that everybody will su will submit to you, if that makes sense. So if, I inv if we invaded Afghanistan, if this class formed a military, and we invaded s the southern part of Afghanistan here and conquered the Pashtun people, that's who's here in gold, the Pashtun, the largest ethnicity in Afghanistan, if we conquered the majority of the Pashtun people uh, and seized some of their roads and lands, just because we do that doesn't mean that Afghanistan as a whole will say, oh no, we're being invaded, we should negotiate and surrender. Like I said before, there is so much decentralization here, there are so many mountains cutting off different groups, you have Taziks over here, you have Taziks here, you have pockets of Taziks throughout, you have the Pashtuns kind of concentrated here in the south, but there's pockets of Pashtuns over here, you have the Uzbeks, you have the Turkmen, they're not going to capitulate. They're not going to surrender to you. Just because you conquered one ethnic group doesn't mean you conquer all the ethnic groups. And just because you conquer these ethnic groups here, the say the Taziks over here, doesn't mean the Taziks over here are going to surrender. So it's very a, a really divided country. Just because you go in and say, take Kabul, which is right here, and seize the Afghani capital, that doesn't mean the entire country is going to submit to you. Because these people don't always recognize Kabul as being the capital. 
people who live in the northern part of the Fertile Plains and happen to be Uzbek and are near Uzbekistan could really care less what happens in Kabul, which is dominated by the Taziks. And they have a close relationship with the Pashto, which are very different from the Uzbeks. Other than the fact that these people all practice Islam, they have nothing in common with each other. I can't stress that enough. I just want to make sure that everybody knows that. And the reason why that's important is because Afghanistan, and I, I'm a little bit older than some of you. I was born in 1986. So when, when the September 11th attacks happened, I was close to my 15th birthday because I was born in November. So I was still 14. I was about to turn 15. So I learned a lot about Afghanistan in my formative years, more, more uh, than perhaps I would like to have known. Uh, if some of you are older, uh, I know there's a few of you who are a little bit older in this class. I learned about Afghanistan the way that some of you may have learned about Vietnam when the Vietnam War was breaking out. And one thing that came up constantly was that Afghanistan was known as a land that could never be conquered because of its terrain, its location, its isolation, its, uh, its uh, resilience to fighting invaders. It was a land that simply could not be conquered. It was a land of death to foreign invaders. I remember in uh, Cleveland, where I grew up, we had uh, a number of s former Soviet soldiers who lived in, in the area, who, was, who were part of the invasion of Afghanistan, which I'll talk about near the end of this sh slideshow and throughout the second show. And they pretty much agreed that you could not really hold this land. It was too difficult. You couldn't. You didn't know who to trust. You didn't know who was on whose side. You didn't know who's, uh, who the allies were. Uh, they all spoke dif different dialects of each other. They, they didn't agree with each other on anything. Customs were different. Even the way they practiced Islam was very different. So it's a very difficult place to, uh, to try and hold if you are a foreign power. And this is going to be proved, this is going to be relevant to us because the United States will eventually become involved in Afghanistan and numerous countries as well. So here's just a very brief list of external forces that attempt to conquer Afghanistan with some mild success, some more successful than others. This is a list that does not include local or internal uh, wars and strife. So local Arab king, or I'm sorry, not, I, even I'm doing it, local uh, kings and, and monarchs from what will, what will be called the Afghani area or the Iranian area or the what becomes India and Pakistan area, people like that, I'm not including that in this. I'm mainly including uh, outsiders who are significantly different enough from the Afghan people to make them uh, fall under the category of foreign invaders. So Alexander the Great marches through Afghanistan. He wins a couple of battles, but over time, very quickly, uh, the Afghanis or the people who would become Afghanis are able to pretty much defeat the Greeks because the Greeks are just moving through and uh, are able to defeat them and cause trouble for them during Alexander's retreat from the east. The Parthian Empire, which is part of present-day Iraq, uh, they take Afghanistan in 200 BCE, and they hold on to it for about 30 years before they finally lose it. The Mongols invade very quickly, and very quickly they lose Afghanistan, since the Mongols had a reputation of invading, setting up a government that was loyal to them, and then leaving, with some governments not always remaining loyal. The modern wars, though, are going to be much more uh, easily understood, because we have, we have clearer timelines for that. So we have a series of wars between Afghanis and the British, the first, second, and third Anglo-Afghan wars, and you can see that they're not very long, and the British lose these. Uh, technically, I think they win the second and third Afghan war, but there isn't a lot to be had from them. I mean, once the British win, they lose so many troops, and they don't really get anything in return from Afghanistan. So even when the British win, they don't really win, they mostly lose, because Afghanistan really is not important. You can't grow anything there. You can't use it. Its importance is strictly as uh, perhaps a trading route, because there are roads, although I mentioned very few of them are actually good for anything. Uh, mainly, the British are interested in, in holding Afghanistan and either holding it as part of their empire or keeping it a neutral kingdom 
to keep the Russian imperial uh, government from holding it because the British are looking for a buffer space between them and India. If I could back up for just one second, you can see that India is right over here. And at that time, Pakistan was part of India as well. So Pakistan and India under the British uh, government, because they were held as a British colony, Pakistan and India were collectively known as Hindustan, kind of in keeping with the Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and Afghanistan moniker. Pakistan and India were Hindustan. And they were looking for, the British were looking for a buffer space to block the Russians who were holding Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan and Tajikistan uh, with the British uh, uh, colonial holdings in India or Hindustan. So at the very at the very least, the British simply wanted a vacant piece of land uh, held by an Afghani monarch that would not help the Russians, would keep the Russians out. So even when the British uh, the British lose the first Anglo-Afghan War, they win the second. I think they technically win the third, although it's a Pyrrhic victory. They lose a lot of people in that uh, in in that war. But again, their 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 point is not to hold. Afghanistan like they like they want to hold Canada or hold India. Their point is simply trying to keep it a neutral space to keep the Russians away from them. The Soviet Union will invade notably in 1979 for 10 years and they will lose that war and that's what we'll focus on in the next slideshow. And the United States will invade Afghanistan in 2001 and to this present day we are technically still there although major operations will end in 2014 we still have a contingency of about 50,000 troops in Afghanistan to this day uh, with casual, casualty lists that come out uh, periodically. The war in Afghanistan between the United States and, um, and the, uh, the Afghani uh, Taliban has gone on for so long that some people forget it even is still going on. Let's get into the main meat of this lecture, and that will be the 1940s, really to the present day, but for this particular video, 1940s to 1979. We're not going to get to all of this. Uh, the second video is going to talk more clearly about the, Af the Soviet invasion, but Afghanistan as a modern state is quite fascinating. So it is a kingdom a couple of times over the course of its history, but the modern kingdom of Afghanistan is more or less created uh, right before World War II, led by Mohammad Zahir Shah, the gentleman pictured over here near my mouse cursor. I'm going to move him out of the way. Uh, Shah is a term widely used in uh, the, the uh, eastern part of the Middle East in Iran and further east in what is officially Asia, because Iran kind of straddles the Middle East slash Asia. And the term Shah typically is used for king. Uh, king or noble prince, whereas the term sultan is used in the western parts of the Middle East, like Iraq or Egypt or uh, Lebanon for monarchs that are uh, Muslim in their traditions. Just a little bit of tidbit there. The Kingdom of Afghanistan is a fairly modern kingdom. You can see, by the way, uh, Mohammed Zahir Shah is dressed. He's dressed, uh, he may be an Afghani man, but he's dressed very European-like. So the Afghanis, although they remain uh, uh, in conflict with the British, and they've, uh, they've had issues with the British, and they've had issues with the Russians as well, uh, they do adopt a number of modern European styles, European dress, uh, guns, uh, uh, modern military tactics to mix with their own. And the Kingdom of Afghanistan itself is a constitutional monarchy with what you can call a House of Commons and a House of Lords. It very much models itself after Great Britain. Muhammad Zahir Shah is considered a progressive reformer, and he institutes these Western reforms throughout the 1930s, 1940s, really into the 1960s. Uh, he's considered what we would call today perhaps quite liberal, uh, at least for his time. Uh, he offers uh, political freedoms uh, to his citizens. He allows them to own, own land. Uh, he allows them to uh, have representation in, um, in the Afghani uh, parliament. Uh, he offers uh, numerous personal freedoms for women. Uh, he abolishes slavery, and he allows women to wear more modern clothing. I don't want to make it sound like that, uh, that uh, the Kingdom of Afghanistan was like uh, New York City circa 1975, uh, with, uh, with hippies and, and uh, uh, women not wearing bras or things like that. But it is a very uh, free and open society 
before its time, especially in the region that it's found. The king of Afghanistan, Mohammad Zayir Shah in particular, is rather savvy. He, he remains very neutral during World War II. He does not want to get involved, whereas India is part of the British Empire, so it is involved in fighting uh, against the uh, Axis powers uh, and uh, other colonies and other countries around them, like Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan, fight on behalf of the Soviet Union because they are part of the Soviet Union. The Kingdom of Afghanistan is going to remain decidedly neutral, not joining any of these, any of the allies or the Axis powers. They form relationships with the U.S. They form relationships with the uh, United Kingdom. They form relationships with Nazi Germany, Japan, and the Soviet Union. Strangely enough, though, the Kingdom of Afghanistan is going to be a little bit closer to the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany, strangely enough. Uh, and that's mainly because they're trying to use Nazi Germany uh, in particular, because the Soviet Union is an ally to the, the British at this time, but they're trying to use Nazi Germany as kind of a counterbalance against the British. The, Af the Kingdom of Afghanistan truly wants to remain neutral, and they're willing to play both sides of, of the Second World War to remain mostly out of the affair. Oh, and lastly, you can see there by the point, uh, in order to kind of build up their infrastructure and their roads, they're willing to be very coy and to promise certain access to Afghani lands and resources in exchange for monies to build up their own infrastructure. Again, very he's very politically savvy here. He's not making any commit uh, commitment whatsoever, but he's taking money from all of these countries with sort of the promise that if needed, he could maybe get involved on their behalf although it never quite comes that he's able to keep himself out of all of this. But the Kingdom of Afghanistan will eventually weaken after World War II as more and more countries around the globe, as we've talked about before with countries like Algeria, and you recall near the end of the Cold War, <clears throat> countries like Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, uh, the former Eastern Bloc of the Soviet Union, they start to become more and more interested in uh, Republican democracy, in liberalism. And this is not too surprising, as you can see by uh, Mohammed Zayir Shah. Just a reminder, he looks very European, specifically he looks very British. Uh, and that's not too surprising because his kingdom is a parliamentary uh, uh, constitutional monarchy with a parliament. So it wouldn't be any surprise and no foregone conclusion that there's a lot of people who live in the kingdom of Afghanistan who are interested in taking that uh, concept of a constitutional monarchy one step further to form a republic, very similar to the kind that we have in the United States. And the gentleman who's going to come to lead that republic is a man named Mohammed Dal Han. Uh, when you see Khan, K-H-A-N, it's actually pronounced Han. Uh, he forms the Republic of Afghanistan in 1973. And while his rule will not be very long, only five years before his assassination, uh, he is going to bring very progressive reforms to Afghanistan, whereas his predecessor Mohammad Zayir Shah can be classified as a as a reform as a progress as a uh, uh, I should say a Western liberal, uh, a reformer in his own right. He's still a monarchist. He's still a king. Mohammad Dawood Khan is a Western liberal liberal. He is politically progressive. And when I say progressive, I am talking specifically about how we think of progressive today. He leans much more decidedly to the left, somewhat similar to his counterparts in Algeria, uh, who were Muslims, but they were not uh, 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 fanatical theocrats. Uh, they were Muslims, but they had an economic interest in socialism and progressive forms of government. In this case, Mohammed Daud Khan is going to be much more progressive than those people. He's going to want a secular government. So he may be Muslim himself, but he does not want a government that even has Islamic law. He wants a truly Western, secular, liberal government with very progressive reforms. He uses or dabbles in socialism though he is not a Marxist or a communist. He rejects Marxism, he rejects Leninism, he rejects Soviet-style communism for various reasons. He thinks that Soviet-style communism is too totalitarian. And because he himself is a Muslim, 
and there's many Muslims in Afghanistan, uh, he knows that these, these people who practice Islam are very dedicated to their faith, and they will never embrace Marxism or communism because Marxism and communism typically asks for atheism in return. So he's still going to try and, and, uh, and defend Islamic tradition, Islamic religion, but he's trying to create a country that's, again, very similar to Western Europe, France, Great Britain, the United States. Countries are secular, who have political progressive ideologies in many ways, uh, modern infrastructure, modern roads, uh, certain degrees of, of wealth redistribution, some more than others, uh, but he is not communist. He's going to, to approach Afghanistan similar to the way Mao approached China in, in the sense that he wants to build a modern industrial state, as industrial as he can, he can make it. So he takes aid money from the United States and from the Soviet Union and other countries as well, and he promotes the, con the, the construction and creation of modern Afghanistan, military, roads, railroads, modern agriculture, and tries to place Afghanistan as a modern player in geopolitical politics, but a very neutral one. So he is savvy, and in many ways, he is considered by a number of historians today as the father of what would have been what would have become a modern Afghanistan. But as you can see, his reign was not very long because he would be assassinated. He would be assassinated by a radical uh, uh, terrorist before, uh, in 1978. Take a look at some of uh, these pictures of Afghanistan during the 1970s uh, under Mohammed uh, Han. These are Afghani women in Kabul. This is in a French magazine, hence Kabul is spelled with a C. Uh, so you can see uh, these women don't look the way we picture Afghani women today. They're wearing mini skirts that are cut above the knee, high heels. Uh, they're wearing blouses that have buttons unbuttoned on the top. I can see parts of their neck, uh, good parts of their neck leading towards their shoulders. Uh, they are dressed very Western. Necklaces, earrings, uh, purses, belts. They look like women who dress in the United States at this time. They look like women that dress in Great Britain. And specifically, they look like women who dress in France. They are borrowing a lot of French styles here. And so Afghanistan, for a time in the 1970s, is going to be considered quite a modern little place. Uh, and it's kind of a, an exotic location to go to. It has beautiful women. It has very uh, dashing and exotic men. It has a, a good university. It's a place that a lot of people want to go to and visit. Uh, check out this picture here. This is the Hotel Intercontinental Kabul, the Inter Intercontinental, uh, Intercontinental uh, Hotel in Kabul. Uh, and there actually are still remnants of the Inter Intercontinental Hotel in Kabul. And this was a resort community. People from the Soviet Union in particular loved to come to Kabul to vacation. It, was, it had a nice climate uh, in Kabul. Uh, it had uh, shopping. It had uh, malls, museums. It had, like I said, beautiful women. It had a nightlife. It had casinos. It had a uh, red light district with, um, uh, unfortunately, but this is true, it comes with modern Western countries, uh, gambling, uh, alcohol, and houses of prostitution. It had, it had all the things that you would find in Vegas. Now, you look at these people. Uh, some of them are Afghanis themselves, and some of them are Europeans. People from the United States, from India, from Europe, they all went to Kabul to sort of vacation there, like some sort of neutral territory. It was kind of like the Switzerland of Asia. It was supposed to be very neutral and kind of exotic and interesting to go to. Uh, if you're a fan of, a, of, a, of James Bond, it would be a great place for a Bond film where all of these, this sort of neutral world where all of these, where, all, where agents from all of these great countries of the world come to gamble and engage in political intrigue. This was what Afghanistan was in the 1970s. Again, another couple of great pictures here of women. On the right, we have uh, a couple of women in a garden, a public garden. You can see they're wearing uh, skirts, single piece skirts. Their hair is cut. Uh, they're showing their legs. They're showing their, uh, their sh they're, they look like modern women. They look like women from the US. And over on the left, these are, believe it or not, these are Afghani women. Afghani women, because the ethnicity of Af the ethnicities of Afghanistan are so diverse, uh, there are Afghani women who are blonde. There are Afghani women with blue uh, blue eyes, also dark hair, dark 
uh, skin features as well. These are women uh, posing for a, a, a fashion show in Kabul, and they are dressed as stewardesses. And yes, at this time, they would have used that term, stewardesses. Uh, these are not real stewardesses. These are women dressed as stewardesses, but they have the go-go boots. Uh, very, very, even by today's standards in some cases, inappropriately short skirts uh, and single pieces, uh, it, part of the mystique of the time. This is for a French fashion show. You would not see this in Afghanistan today, of course. But a lot of this radical culture shifting and liberalization, especially where culture and women are concerned, are going to lead to a lot of problems. Uh, Mohammed uh, uh, Han is, is sort of middle of the road. He does lean to the left pol uh, uh, politically and economically, more economically perhaps, but he's going to be kind of a crossroads figure. In some cases, some are going to see him as too radical and hostile to these traditional tribal uh, uh, conservative customs, especially where women are concerned. And uh, where is traditional traditional tribal uh, interpretations of Islam are concerned as well, covering women and making sure that women are not allowed to work. Uh, that's on one side. On the other, Mohammed Han is going to be seen as too politically neutral and not socialist or leftist enough. And so he's going to be caught in the crosshair of extreme leftist radicalism on one side and extreme right-wing Islamic fundamentalism on the other, and tribal Islamic fundamentalism on the other side. And this will lead to his assassination in 1978. So Muhammad Han, his progressive reforms are going to be viewed as too secular. As you can see by these other pictures, this is for Afghanistan considered very secular. So his views are going to be considered very uh, secular, despite the fact that they were successful. And because Afghanistan is so divided geographically as well as uh, culturally and ethically, what Mohammed Han calls uh, modern Afghanistan, wh where his reforms really take root, are only going to be in the urban areas of Kabul, Jahalabad, and in a very, very limited case in Herat and Kandahar. Although Herat and Kandahar, although they're larger cities, are going to be considered more conservative and a little bit more a little bit more leaning towards tribal interpretations of fundamentalist Islam. It's mainly going to be in Kabul and Jalalabad, where uh, where Mohammed Daud Han is going to be the most popular, and where people like those women dressed in miniskirts are going to be found. Other places in Afghanistan are going to vary from region to region. So these more cut off and isolated areas are still going to be ruled not by modern governors or commissioners or the president himself, but by local tribal leaders and warlords. And they're going to be ruled by tribal law. Uh, women are going to be governed by tribal law. And Islam there is going to take on a much more tribal fundamentalist uh, uh, style. What some of us today might refer to simply as in the, in the popular media, the term radical Islam, but that's not very appropriate because Islam is so diverse, it really does vary. This is what I like to refer to as tribal fundamentalist Islam. It's very much the religion of a, of a poorer, more isolated, very rural uh, people. And if you think about it in that sense, there are different religions that, that have people that are extremists that have that similar background. They're very rural, very tribal, and they live in very isolated areas. Uh, and Islam is no different. And there are uh, Jewish uh, groups that are very similar, and there are Christian groups that are very similar too. So I prefer the term tribal fundamentalist Islam as opposed to radical Islam. It's, it's far too broad, and it's more of a media buzzword and a political buzzword than anything else. On the other side, I mentioned before, the extreme pro-communist uh, 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 sentiment that exists in Kabul and other parts of the urban areas, too, think that Mohammed Daud Han is not uh, uh, radical enough. And they're going to overthrow him in a revolution in 1978 called the April Revolution or the People's Revolution. And the Republic of Afghanistan will cease to exist after April of 1978 and be replaced by the, Demo the Democratic Republic of Afghanistan. 
point of note here for all of you, when you see the term democratic republic, it usually is a socialist or communist uh, society, whereas republic is usually uh, a, new, a more middle of the road uh, or maybe more right-leaning nation. The Republic of Afghanistan was left-leaning, but still more little, uh, middle of the road. The Democratic Republic of Afghanistan is going to be a communist state. And it's going to be a communist state in, uh, in, in league and in line with the Soviet Union. Barack Kamal, who is the general secretary of the Afghanistan, uh, the Afghani uh, People's uh, Democratic Communist Party, will become president in 1979, and he'll hold that position until his death uh, in the early 1990s. And this is where we're going to run into a lot of problems because if the if the traditional tribal uh, fundamentalists who live in the countryside thought that uh, Mohammed Dawood Khan was too secular and too pro-women for their tastes, too Western, the People's Democratic uh, Party of Afghanistan, the Afghanistan Soviet Socialist Party, is going to be even more secular. It's going to promote atheism, and it's going to work very hard to squash out what they saw as backwards uh, Islamic fundamentalism. So uh, Karmal, this gentleman here, is going to take it upon himself to essentially make war against these tribal leaders in the hinterland. And that's going to cost him uh, his country more or less. The People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan, what you might simply refer to as a Soviet, uh, is referred to as the Communist Party of Afghanistan, rules like the Soviet Union with an iron fist. It tries to squash out Islam. It closes uh, uh, mosques that they can close. It tries to uh, secularize the nation. It tries to bring uh, Marxism and Leninism to the, uh, the Afghanistan as a whole, not just the urban areas, but all of Afghanistan. It tries to promote universal women's rights because the Soviet Union, as bad as it could be, uh, communism does champion universal equality in a classless society, whether it's regardless of race, religion, or creed. So they try to promote atheism, they try to uh, promote equal uh, rights for women. They try to promote uh, um, secularism and secular law. They try to ban religion. They try to ban tribal law. They try to close mosques. And very, very quickly, they find themselves pretty much in war with all of Afghanistan. All of these other groups, all of these other tribal groups, especially the Pashtu and the, and, uh, and, uh, the Uzbeks and people in the northern and, and more isolated regions, uh, are going to be absolutely infuriated with this. And they're going to see the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan as being uh, a Western infiltration, an attack upon traditional Afghani cultures and values, and an attack upon Islam by the West. This creates great instability in the region and in the country. And in 1979, the Soviet Union deploys 80,000 troops to try and support and prop up this increasingly unpopular government uh, in Kabul. As more and more Soviet troops rolled in from the northern border, from Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan over into Afghanistan, the presence of these foreign troops, as you can see I have written down here, uh, further infuriated Af uh, Afghani rebels, these much more traditional tribal peoples. They saw the presence of the Soviet Union and their tanks and their military and of course the communism that they brought as being more and more uh, akin to an invasion from a foreign outside power. And so very slowly they form loose tribal uh, military and militia groups to take on uh, these foreign invaders and these atheists bringing these, these, uh, these, uh, these outside ideas and these secular atheistic ideas uh, and uh, fight them to the death on behalf of the Islamic world. And this is where the beginning of the Soviet-Afghan war will, be, that will start. That concludes the first slideshow presentation. The second one will continue with the war between the Soviet Union and Afghanistan. Thank you for watching.